it, Dr. Patel. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Patel. I work with um, uh, Swedish Neurosciences and uh, the Seattle Science Foundation. Uh, I run a mock oral board review course uh, throughout the year and have uh, examinees, uh, fellows uh, in our program, test out for the boards uh, mock, in, a, in a mock session so they get practice. Today, I thought uh, I would do a lecture that I've, which I've given before on peripheral nerve um, issues and how to deal with peripheral nerve for the board specifically. Um, I think this will be one of many lectures regarding peripheral nerve um, because peripheral nerve appears to be one of those uh, topics that makes everyone very nervous in the board section. And just to give you an example, it can it, it will also be it'll, it'll impact both um, those people who are taking their board exam and review for orthopedics for the spine practice, because peripheral nerves is just an extension of the of the spine, and uh, it will also greatly affect those individuals taking any portion of their neurosurgery boards. Typically, uh, on the neurosurgery board specifically, since, since I have had more experience, I've, I've taken those. Uh, if you do the general section, or or you will have to do a general section in that in that um, board uh, format, you will get uh, one peripheral nerve question, um, and that you know may vary from person to person how difficulty that, that that is. If you do decide to do two general neurosurgery sections, so you don't have a specialty in mind, and you decide to have a second general neurosurgery section, you'll definitely get a peripheral nerve question uh, for sure, uh, given what I know of the examiners and. Uh, and what they're what they're prepping people for, uh, seeing commonly in general practice. Uh, that being said, um, I also want to make a plug uh, today. Uh, if you want to give someone a Christmas present, um, and you want you're thinking about giving someone a Christmas present, uh, this book, um, which I've used for my practice with the Or Board, and I'm not, I don't get paid. Uh, it's not a paid advertisement or anything like that. This is just a book that I want to show to people that they should probably review. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure some of you have heard the story of Christopher Lee, the guy who played Saruman in Lord of the Rings. He used to read the Lord of the Rings every Christmas as a tradition. And I think this is one of those books that I read every Christmas as a traditional thing. It's very, it's very quick. It's, a, you know, probably uh, 200 pages at most and uh, an easy read, but also gets you in the mindset of thinking. Even someone like myself, who's been in practice now five, six years, uh, re requires an occasional review of the peripheral nerves um, and very useful in practice in terms of just understanding that and how to approach it. But in any event, I want to go through how you would approach this uh, for our oral board section uh, and how to think about it. Um, it's kind of a little bit about uh, strategy uh, and how to plan ahead, how to understand that this is a peripheral nerve question, how to pick it up right away. Uh, but also, once you delve into it, uh, how to deal with that problem. So sometimes you may uh, encounter, for example, a spine case and you don't know how to rule out a a, this, that this is going down a peripheral nerve, uh, in, the, down the root, root of peripheral nerve uh, versus being something else. It's very useful to have an overall strategy. And one of the goals uh, of this uh, brief lecture will be how to develop that strategy. The, the biggest thing is, like I mentioned, be prepared for the peripheral nerve section. Uh, books like the one I just showed you are very useful. Um, other books um, out there um, include uh, AIDS to Examination of Peripheral Nerve, which is one that is on a lot of reading lists for, for neurosurgery and neurology as they are in, as, as become, become interns. There's small sections in Greenberg that may be helpful, but those are usually too brief. Uh, anything with plenty of pictures and anatomy is very helpful. Uh, some orthopedic textbooks um, have a lot of approaches uh, on how to do surgery since uh, a lot of peripheral nerve surgery crosses the boundary between general surgery, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, and neurosurgery, uh, and plastics as well. And so with covering all of those things, it can be uh, good to have a book that has a lot of pictures. Uh, and you can find that typically in orthopedic literature. When you do approach a patient who has peripheral nerve disease, you've got to think of a couple of things, uh, power, strength, pressure, proprioception, sensation, and pain. Um, those are the main things to think about when asking a patient those questions. And on the oral boards, you've got to go through each of the three Ps. You know, how strong are they? Do they feel a sensation? Can they tell whether they, what, what, where, they, where that digit leg extremity is in space? Um, do they feel pain at any point 
during the movement or during palpation of that limb extremity uh, or, or sh shoulder or hip girdle. Um, and I say this because then you can detect, you know, cerebellar signs, central signs versus peripheral signs. And it's very good to do this to develop a, a sense of a differential diagnosis. In general, if you see power issues, sensation, of proprioception issues, in addition to pain issues, there's more likely to be a peripheral nerve issue rather than, uh, than, than anything else because of all three being combined. That's a generality. Um, we also have to talk about, you know, the, when, 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 when going through the oral board examination, the examiners are not going to give you information. Uh, in fact, they'll hide information and, and leave it to the slides to provide what they can. And you have to ask and delve into those um, questions. For most examiners, if you can imagine the, uh, the if you can imagine the board or mock oral board review, they want to keep this as standardized as possible. So they're not going to volunteer information that they volunteered you as an examinee that they didn't volunteer a previous examinee. So most of the information is on the slides that the examiner has to stick to the script. There are some examiners that go off script, but that is usually for extra points or they just want to know uh, how to bail you out or how to re-guide you back to uh, the appropriate direction. Remember, these, these individuals are trying to make sure that you're a safe surgeon, but they're also not trying to fail you or, keep you or, 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 or provide unnecessary traps to make you nervous. So they always guide you back to the slides, um, and, they are, and, that, and that's important to know. So as you ask your questions, if you feel like your questions are not in sync with the slide that you're currently seeing, or the slide that's about to come up, or that you see next, um, then you need to really take a step back. It's okay to, to slow down, take a breather, and ask more questions. And this is important to ask about history, and in terms of peripheral nerve, uh, injuries, and and uh, in regard to entrapment syndromes, just what kind of pain issues they may be having, um, any uh, recent um, uh, recent degen degenerative issues that they may be encountering, the patient may be encountering, uh, and as you ask those questions, it may guide you to the right spot. So, uh, things to think about. Also, remember that uh, for peripheral nerve, there's very few peripheral nerve experts that truly know peripheral nerve where, and I'm talking about the examiners themselves, and so. Uh, it's important to know that you may have read and be more well versed in peripheral nerve than the examiner, but uh, they have their slides that have been designed to be kind of standard throughout um, and throughout all the examination questions. And so they, the examiners themselves may rely on those slides. So use that to your advantage. We're going to go through the physical exam a little bit uh, and what that means for you. Um, and really the most important question is pain. So uh, of the three Ps, pain appears to be the most important thing when, when regarding any question on the, on, the, on the boards, if you suspect a spine, a spinal or peripheral nerve issue. So ask, ask about pain, really delve into that pain. Is it reproducible? Uh, how severe is it? Uh, where is it? Uh, can they point, can the patient point to the pain? Um, and is there a distribution that, um, is, there, is there a clear uh, delineation of distribution that you can tell just by ex asking those questions, whether it's dermatomal, non-dermatomal, focus in one area around a certain joint, um, radiates from central to peripheral or peripheral to central? Um, does it, uh, is it, is, is it um, uh, related to any recent trauma um, and uh, are there any things that make it better or worse? So definitely ask about pain. Uh, and for extra points, um, if anyone can tell me who this character is, that'll be interesting to know if anyone knows. Um, now, once you're able to identify pain, so use Tenel sign. It's an, and Tenel sign is basically percussion. So percuss the area of pain. Uh, since the mock oral board of you has transitioned recently to a virtual session, it will eventually go back to you know in person. But virtual sessions for the for the oral boards for now uh, requires you to kind of uh, show on your body where you would percuss and localize the pain. So use Tenel sign, which is basically percussion uh, tapping on the area where there's pain. Uh, you should uh, be able to palpate that region. Mass lesions uh, can be discovered that way. Discoloration of the skin can be covered that way. Discoloration of the skin is, skin is important because of trauma, bruising, um, 
any um, recent uh, um, inflammatory uh, issues can be uh, noted, noted on the skin. So those are very important things to notice just on visual inspection. And then beyond that, ask questions about the use of ultrasound, MRI, and x-ray. Now, ultrasound is actually a very useful adjunct to look at nerves, whether they're swollen, entrapped, um, if there's any, um, uh, any uh, structure around the nerve itself that may be causing the entrapment to get worse. Um, and then beyond that, moving on to an MRI scan, especially the joints, brachial plexus, uh, and so for joints and brachial plexus, whether it's the ankle joint, the knee joint, the elbow joint, the wrist, and then the brachial plexus itself in the cervical region, um, especially after trauma, it's very good to use the MRI scan to help you. And where it gets tough is if you ask for an MRI scan, you, sh you should be able to know how to read the MRI scan too. So I would get uh, you know, used to, when you're, when you're reading about peripheral nerve and studying the peripheral nerve for the peripheral nerve for the examination, uh, just Googling, and it's very easy, just to Google uh, images, T1 and T2 images of certain joints and with the highlight, the cross-sectional highlights of where the nerves are. And, you know, they'll make it obvious on the exam if there's something obvious like a cyst or a tumor that's compressing the nerve um, or that's involving the nerve. Um, an ultrasound often is hard to interpret uh, even in the exam setting. So most examiners will say that the nerve appeared swollen on the ultrasound, for example. And then for, for, classic, uh, for classic trauma, uh, x-rays are very useful. Uh, and the most common question when it comes to x-rays is the humeral fracture that involves a radial nerve. So a pearl there, a dark pearl there is a humeral fracture of uh, a humeral fracture involving the radial nerve and what that will cause. So that is classic, that board questioning, and you will see that uh, as one of the more common questions. Um, it's less common to see uh, femoral fractures and what that would involve in the sciatic nerve, but certainly that's another question that can, could could arise. But the main uh, fractures that you may see are humeral and femoral. Um, and then less commonly so, uh, radial ulnar fractures that may involve um, either the median or um, ulnar nerve. In any event, uh, ask for x-rays if you suspect trauma, and then also think about where that fracture is in, in relation to where the nerves pass and what that could involve and which portion of the nerve that can involve. But as I said, the, the humeral fracture in the radial nerve is the most uh, common uh, question regarding fractures, so always ask for that. When we talked about before the three Ps, you know, you want to build your differential diagnosis um, and and kind of start ruling out things. So we talked about pain uh, and what is the origin of the pain, um, and then just start with a classic examination that you would do if you were, a, you know, a spine surgeon. Check strength, check sensation, check the rectal exam, but also check skin, and it's important to check the skin. Um, because that will give you clues as to differentiating between a central, uh, you know, spinal cord uh, issue versus a, uh, uh, a more peripheral nerve issue. And the skin, and, and, and I don't mean just, uh, just the coloration of the skin, as I mentioned before, but also whether the skin is able to sweat, whether it's um, discolored, obviously, um, but whether there's any abrasions or any trauma to the skin in that region uh, that you can tell pretty quickly. The rectal exam, obviously, classic for looking for central issues. Uh, never forget to do that uh, in, on, the, on the oral boards, um, whether uh, you are suspicious for a spine versus a cranial, cranial lesion, for example, in the case of stroke. Um, you want to still mention that you would do that just to make sure that you, that you are telling the examiner. Uh, and like I said, preparation is key. You're telling the examiner everything you're thinking about. Don't keep anything to yourself. And strategically, as an examinee, keeping things to yourself uh, and letting your mind think is okay. But eventually, when you've sourced out what you and, and parsed out what you think is the best thing to the best direction to go, please state all the things uh, that got you there in an al algorithmic way. You know, you know, if you're thinking about if you're taking a step back and thinking about this is a spinal cord issue, for example, say. I want to check strength, I want to check sensation, I want to check the rectal exam, and I want to check uh, the entire body and do a, a head-to-toe examination of the skin and of the body, looking for any 
deformations, any um, trauma, any wounds, any uh, oddness of the body itself. I'll go through um, uh, some classic uh, peripheral entrapments, but the six most common entrapments on the uh, on the oral boards are going to be carpal tunnel, ulnar nerve at the elbow specifically, perineal, perineal nerve palsy, AIN palsy, anterior interosseous nerve uh, palsy, posterior interosseous nerve palsy, and suprascapular nerve palsy. The last three less common in the if you're just going to doing one general section, but more common if you're doing more than one general section. Brachial plexus um, uh, issues are for those uh, individuals who are showing that they're doing very well uh, on their oral board section, uh, and they're taking a general, they're taking a second general section, and the examiner just wants to know uh, how well they're performing. Uh, but we won't go into that in this lecture uh, today. Uh, that will be subject for a future lecture, but I do hope that we can get to the brachial plexus uh, sometime later. This is very important to kind of also um, st strategically think about how to deal with brachial plexus issues, and that is a lecture all in itself. So some classic things uh, for carpal tunnel. You should remember all of these things. Um, so carpal tunnel has some very classic signs, and if any of these things present themselves, Will come to the surface or bubble to the surface as you are asking the examiner or going through the exam question. Um, the pain is uh, on the wrist, on the right radial digits. Uh, flexion extension makes it classically worse. Improve with shaking out. So you have to actually ask, does, is the pain improved with shaking out? Uh, a later sign is atrophy of thenar eminence. And that's something where you have to just ask the examiner, can you examine the thenar eminence uh, if you suspect carpal tunnel syndrome? Uh, Tenel sign percussion over the wrist, uh, and just as the wrist uh, crossing over into the into the um, into the forearm. Uh, Phelan sign, uh, you know, having maximal flexion or extension, um, either reversed or normal Phelan sign to see if the pain is worse. And then obviously on your differential, making sure that you're not missing a C6, C7 radiculopathy um, as well. So it's important that you know if they show you an MRI scan that looks absolutely normal, the cervical spine. You want to just look at that those levels, or if they didn't provide an MRI scan, ask for, that you are considering an MRI scan just to rule out the C67 radiculopathy. They may just say, I don't, you know, you did that earlier and didn't show anything, or the patient didn't get that. But you have to say these things, especially when you specifically know. And to get all the points, uh, to get all the points, the maximal points, you have to mention these seven things um, in a carpal tunnel question. So you have to mention all these things so that you get all the points for the workup and, and diagnosis. Whether or not the surgery, uh, you know, as you describe it uh, and how you do it, that's a separate issue. But, you know, the, the points are maximally gained by going through these um, seven items. Um, the surgery itself, we can talk about uh, later, but uh, it's, it's a pretty standard surgery and you should be able to get through that without too much of, of an issue. Ulnar nerve at the elbow, six things to get maximal points. Um, the uh, pain is uh, down to the ulnar side of the digits of the hand. Uh, worse with flexion of the elbow is a tenel sign at the elbow. Um, you know, as we talk about the olecranon um, and the eminence of the uh, uh, of the humerus, and you know, check for snapping of the nerve of the medial epicondyle. Just looking over here, I can't show you, but you know, here and that and that, uh, make sure that you can. Uh, ask the exam, examiner or examine that you would flex the arm and see if there's any snap of the, of the medial epicondyle. Look for the intrinsic muscles of the hand, the classic nerves, the, the classic peripheral nerve that are all supplied by the ulnar nerve in the hand. And then your differential diagnosis, uh, you have to mention that you would look for uh, radiculopathy, C8, uh, T1, um, radiculopathy, uh, tumors, um, thoracic outlet syndrome, that's TOS things that would um, propel you to the next level because they, they may give you a pancose tumor um, and stop the exam they stop the exam there because you, you're able to check a CT scan of the chest and diagnose it. So you might not even get to the point where you did surgery uh, necessarily. They may just go to the point where you be able to get through differential diagnosis, got all the points, the surgery plus minus. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, sometimes you get an examiner, for example, none of my examiners, when I, had, when I took the boards, 
had done any peripheral nerve in 30 or 40 years. So them asking me questions about how, how I would do a carpal tunnel or a column nerve release uh, was, was a little bit ironic or comical, I would say. And so you may know more about that surgery than they do. And so going through the steps of surgery, they're not going to care as much about as long as you're safe in doing it as opposed to the diagnosis. And part of that safety is being able to diagnose the patient accurately without and not putting them through an unnecessary operation uh, that they don't need or uh, indicated or, or, a, or the incorrect spot of surgery or the incorrect location. You have to memorize this slide, uh, which is all the sensational portions of the hand, um, because one of the most easy ways to pick up peripheral nerve issues is just to ask the examiner uh, what, uh, you know, in detail, and, and as you go through as a super sleuth, uh, as a Sherlock Holmes, you know, asking about, you know, and you have to pretend like you're Sherlock Holmes with, with his peripheral nerve, with his peripheral nerve sensation issues, especially in the hand, what supplies what, uh, the radial nerve versus the ulnar nerve, and uh, what digits may be affecting where the nerves uh, uh, originate from. And this is a particularly important when it comes to Guillain's canal, which is uh, that canal that the ulnar nerve its divisions run, uh, you know, as the ulnar nerve enters into the wrist at, at the um, at the wrist joint uh, between the uh, proximal bones of the uh, hand, and so that is important to know how the ulnar nerve can get compressed in that location, in addition to obviously the elbow. Uh, a dark pearl is the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve arises um, proximal to the wrist. And so that will really affect your, your peripheral nerve examination in terms of sensation. So memorize this um, because it is very important to know, again, like I mentioned, and I'll keep repeating myself here, what is median nerve versus ulnar nerve uh, and what is exclusively ulnar nerve and median nerve and where these nerves branch in the proximal forearm so that you can localize the lesion um, much more uh, with much more uh, grace than 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 if you're just kind of uh, trying to figure this out on your own uh, or trying trying to differentiate specifically in this case the dark pearl here Guillain's canal compression of the ulnar nerve versus um, compression of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. The other big testing item, um, especially uh, that they want to know how well you think about this is the L5 radiculopathy. Uh, and this will be tested on, on the spinal section of a board, on the general section of the board, on the stroke section, or the supervascular section, any section really. Um, and the reason they do this is because they wanna know how well you think outside the box and whether or not you can build a differential. And then lastly, how much neurology you know as either a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon. Um, the differential diagnosis of foot drop, sciatica, peri perineal nerve injury at the um, head of the, the, the fibula at the knee, um, stroke can cause foot drop, transverse myelitis can cause foot drop, multiple sclerosis can cause foot drop, and you have to be able to think out of the box when it comes to foot drop. Uh, testing for uh, radiculopathy, uh, you have to test the posterior tibialis. If there's posterior tibialis weakness, it's more likely to be an L5 radiculopathy. If the patient has eversion weakness, it's more likely to be a perineal, perineal nerve injury. Uh, and so it's important, important to say that clearly as you talk to the examiner and say that you've thought about these things. Even if you, even if you suspect that you're, up, you're gonna be barking up the right tree, uh, and this is, this is you know, one, of the one of the most classic questions is per perineal nerve versus L5 radiculopathy. And they are going to want you to operate on a essentially normal MRI. And they'll make it obvious. They'll, they'll show you a normal MRI scan, lumbar spine. Doesn't have any herniated disc. May show some mild degeneration, but certainly very, or very mild framal stenosis at L4-5. And they want to know whether or not you'll operate on that. And some people will. They might even show you a grade one spondy in that location too, that does not have any flexion extension that changes on, or any changes on flexion extension x-ray and prompt you to want to do a fusion on it, even though there may be facet joint issues and, and capsule fluid. Um, they're really going to want to see if you're going to do un unindicated surgery. And one of the ways they do that is to test out how well you think about the L5 radiculopathy. 
also transverse myelitis. I got transverse myelitis as a question on the exam. There's always going to be one uh, question that has is, is a neurology question, has, has well, does not require any surgery. Uh, and the most common things are transverse myelitis, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. ALS is not really, uh, really. Um, considered necessarily the biggest thing, but uh, ALS, transverse myelitis, and multiple sclerosis. And if you're doing the cerebrovascular section, stroke obviously uh, will cause these problems as well. And, you know, every if you do the, if, for those of you who do the neurosurgery um, board, uh, the neurosurgery board review, um, Dr. Skinner uh, is a peripheral nerve expert. And he is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, respected names in peripheral nerve surgery, especially on the uh, neurosurgery side. Uh, and he is a frequent consultant for the examiners, uh, for the people of the ABNS who create the questions that are peripheral nerve based. And Dr. Skinner, who I respect greatly, um, has um, a set of uh, hands that he goes through that are most the most common hands that you know that he sees or that he that he uh, you know tells the examiners of the oral, or for the oral boards the ABNS examiners that are common and good signs good questions to ask examinees if they know and if you do the Goodman uh, oral board review course uh, he is if, you, if you're lucky enough he will he will be there and he will go through uh, some of the stuff but I wanted to just show you this is his uh, classic five hands. Um, the first one is the OK sign. And the OK sign is basically an, an, an inability to make an O. So this is the inability to make an O uh, because of the paralysis of the terminal phalanges, uh, the flexor, uh, perf uh, flexor uh, profundus longus and the flexor digitorum profundus. Um, the, the index finger uh, because of the weakness of these distal phalanges, the index finger and the thumb cannot make, cannot uh, oppose their tips. And so the volar surfaces uh, come in contact with each other. And so this is the affected extremity. This is the normal extremity. You're asking them to get their, the, the tip of the index finger, the tip of the, the thumb finger to touch, and they can't do that if they have an injury uh, to the anterior interosseous nerve. And so they're unable to make this O. Um, and so, the, like I said, the volar surfaces does touch each other, to touch each other in this case. Um, and so, uh, this is a, one of the classic signs for AIN. You should you should keep that in the back in your back pocket at all times. Uh, ask the patient to make an O sign; they won't be able to do it. And you'll see a you'll see a, a picture like this, and that's classic for that. The next sign is a high median nerve palsy. So, uh, this is another word for this sign, and a. a uh, a is the affected extremity. Basically, you ask them to make a fist, and what happens is that their index finger and thumb barely move, or they can't make a fist. And this is sometimes called a Benedictine sign. Um, and so, uh, like, like when the Pope gives a benediction, uh, but they can't, they, people can't do this. They, what ends up happening is they have a, they can't close the index and, and can't oppose the thumb. And so, the flexor profundus is supplied by the ulnar nerve, and so they can close the other fingers, but the, the median nerve is unable to do that. Um, when I mentioned skin earlier, you know, this person has had uh, trauma uh, higher up in their elbow and uh, forearm region, and so uh, it's usually a high median nerve palsy that causes this problem, so uh, not, not at the wrist. Um, and so high median nerve palsy can be, can be identified by this, by this exam finding. The ulnar claw nerve, classic for ulnar nerve uh, is issues, and that's just something that they, they the patients just have a resting, um, peering uh, hand like this, uh, and this is classic for the ulnar nerve. The wrist drop, uh, um, seen uh, for uh, radial nerve injuries, is all, of all the extensors that are involved in radial nerve. Classic for this is if you have a midarm injury, for example, uh, a humeral fracture, like I mentioned earlier in the lecture, the triceps is actually normal uh, and sensory loss uh, is seen in the posterior forearm and dorsal of the wrist, but you have a classic wrist drop. So a classic wrist drop, uh, the preservation of tricep strength is typically humeral uh, or in that location, let's say a humeral fracture 
Um, so the wrist drop is classic for radial nerve injury. Um, so these are just the hands that you should remember. The posterior interosseous inter nerve palsy, um, hard to pick up and one of the more rare things. Um, the class, but what you should remember is the wrist dorsiflexion uh, is only strong in the radial deviated uh, direction. And so that is the, that, that is the way to pick up a peripheral nerve uh, palsy. Um, and that's what you will see here. Uh, the uh, finger drop is in the uh, metacarpal laryngeal joints. And in any event, uh, one of the more rarer signs, but sensation is totally normal. And you should definitely try to memorize these, uh, you know, hand signs. I think there was five or six of those. Miscellaneous on the boards uh, are lumps and bumps. I talked about earlier in the lecture that you should palpate for um, different um, regions of the body if you if you suspect a peripheral nerve issue. And sometimes examiners will give you a peripheral nerve tumor, um, benign or malignant. Make, make sure that you have uh, a differential diagnosis in your mind about this. Know some of the other skin markers for neurofibromatosis um, so that you know exactly the differences between NF1 and NF2 and the signs for NF1 on the skin. Um, and understand uh, like sometimes these patients have cysts in, in their joints. Uh, and the classic joint cyst that you will see is a joint cyst at the, per at the perineal nerve and the fibular neck. Um, and uh, so the foot drop in that location uh, and palpation of a cyst in that joint or identification of a cyst by MRI or by ultrasound will, will, will hint at that diagnosis and will help you with that diagnosis. Um, and then more rare, but more likely to be seen on your, on your more advanced general neurosurgery section is malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors and, and what to do. Uh, and the strategy to deal with those. And although I don't think an examiner is going to push you too far if, you, if it's a very difficult operation, uh, because that usually requires multi-specialty involvement, um, and that is a more tough question, but they may just ask you about uh, how to diagnose that as opposed to going through all the, um, the, the nuances of it. Remember, like I said, midway through the lecture, some of these examiners haven't seen a peripheral nerve or picked up a peripheral nerve textbook in 30 or 40 years. Uh, and so they're relying on the advice of people like Dr. Skinner about how to examine these patients, how to examine the examiner, examinees, and how to uh, identify which examine, examiner, examinees are safe versus dangerous and how to understand their thinking and make sure that they are thinking about peripheral nerve. So they may not actually go into the details of any surgery because it's very, they may not even realize what kind of incision to make. And that's one of the most common questions that I get asked, you know, are the examiners going to ask about what kind of incision I need to make for, for, these, uh, for these. But in general, if you're in the appropriate location, the, the incision doesn't matter. Um, so long as you're in the right location and, you are, and you're diagnosing the patient accurately with what peripheral nerve issue they have, the incision means, mean, uh, is less important. Um, one of the other questions that uh, is a non-surgical but classic, and we, you'll probably see this more often, is acute brachial plexitis or parsonage turner syndrome. Uh, and remember, classically, they have pain first and then followed by weakness. I'll repeat myself. Pain first, followed by weakness. And it will probably involve multiple branches of the brachial plexus, multiple uh, weakness episodes, do not fall into the trap of doing cervical spine surgery, like a posterior cervical foraminotomy, uh, you know, if you're trying to be safe, you know, as opposed to doing an uh, angiocervical discectomy or fusion. Do not fall in the trap of doing spine surgery on a brachial plexitis case. Uh, pain always precedes weakness, and they'll definitely show you that time course. It is one of the more common questions now, because actually, because of COVID, uh, you will see... Uh, more cases of Parsons Turner syndrome after the vaccine uh, than previously thought, uh, even the flu vaccine as well. So vaccinations, you know, taking a front seat now, you may see more questions about brachial plexitis um, that have uh, come about uh, after uh, the second dose or booster dose. Uh, you want to avoid the trap of operating on those patients.
I think uh, the last piece I want to talk about is peripheral nerve injury. I alluded to this earlier in the lecture, uh, but peripheral nerve injury, uh, you, you know, sometimes very difficult and very challenging to deal with. And I'll only briefly go through what is important for the examiners in this case, and that is the rule of threes. Um, so the reconstruction timing. They may not ask you about uh, how to get you know, how to put two pieces of brachial plexus back together. They may not ask you about how to deal with transections. Uh, but importantly, you need to make sure that you have enough tissue to bring together. That's one thing. So if you need to harvest, um, you know, saphenous. Oh, sorry, not saphenous. Um, uh, I'm blacking on the name of the nerve, but then you know, uh, basically, if, if you have uh, if you have to harvest nerve from elsewhere, that you, you you've prepped out that portion of the extremity to harvest nerve. But what's important is if, if you have a transection which is sharp, you want to get that reconstruction done immediately within the first three days. If you have a blunt, blunt or jagged uh, destruction of the nerve. Uh, then you have uh, with three weeks uh, that includes, um, you know, propeller, you know, my, I got my head, my, my arm stuck in a propeller on the water kind of thing, or something of that nature. Closed injury, including gun, gunshot wounds, you can wait up to three to six months to fix this. Um, and it's okay to do the surgery right away um, to identify the nerve. Like you'll never go wrong if you say, I'm going to do surgery right away to explore the nerve but to, to do the official repair, I'm gonna tag the nerves so that I can repair it at a later time. I'm gonna debride and clean the wound. Um, and that may be, a, a, may be more, of, more of the case in blunt injuries and gunshot wounds and things like that. You'll ta tag both ends of the nerves so that later when it comes to repair, you can have um, the blue proline to kind of get things together, or you can develop a strategy of how to put the nerves together to repair them, uh, whether you're doing a graft or not at a later time. In any event, I'm going to end the lecture there. Uh, I'll see if anyone has any questions on the Zoom channel. Well, if no one has any questions, I appreciate that. And um, I'll let you guys go. Have a great day. And I'll see you uh, for the next lecture. Oh, one announcement before I leave. Sorry, Corey, one announcement before I leave. Uh, next year, starting in January, um, we're going to have uh, more of a didactic sessions with invited lecturers um, uh, in lieu of the mock oral boards to give uh, the mock oral board review session a little bit of a break. Uh, and then we can either intersperse uh, exam, 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 exam questions in, in throughout, throughout the year, um, or, or we'll revisit some of these other didactic lectures as well. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, I'll leave. Okay.